Welcome to the Movie Heaven, Movie Hell podcast extra. Now, uh, if you listened to the last podcast extra where we were talking about our first short films, you would have heard Keith talk about the fact that he directed a feature film, which to me is a complete surprise because it's not on his filmography. Uh, so um, I asked Keith if he was willing to talk about it, and uh, he's agreed to do it. So, um, Keith, yeah, well, um, why not? It's it's next in the chronology of my memoirs that we're recording here, isn't it? So, <laughs> uh, you're right, though. I I don't. It's not something that I make um, particularly common knowledge in terms of it doesn't come up uh, often when I'm talking about you know my films and my filmmaking simply because sadly um there isn't a finished product uh which is which is a true but I, i'm gonna say this i'm gonna say this now you made a feature film yes and whatever happened it wasn't your fault that it didn't get released yeah well i mean you, you know it's all about lessons learned and whatever so um basically what 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 had happened was um We'd obviously talked about this is when I still lived in the United States, and this was before I moved to Los Angeles. So this was when I was still in Florida. Um, you know, I'd finished the film program. Uh, I was doing an internship uh, over at um, Vaughan Broadcast, which was part of Chapman Leonard Studios. Uh, I was also working um, part time for the college as well. Uh, you know, as a sort of assistant on films and truck driver and you know all round good guy obviously um <laughs> and y y you know it was it was that kind of period where i'd graduated um the official work p permit had not come through yet it took about 6 6 to 8 months for that to materialize it's just you know the paperwork of the whole thing and yeah. uh, I was sort of in limbo. And, and you know, obviously I jumped on the opportunity to direct uh, my first short film, which was Overpass, which we talked about last time that I, that I managed to shoot on film. Um, I'd also produced a short film for a friend of mine uh, at the film school called The Wheelchair People, um, which we shot using uh, 35 mil uh, short ends, which I think we talked a little bit about what that is on a previous podcast so I won't go there um so I've been doing a bit of that and um what happened was uh Ralph Clemente the great Ralph Clemente I'm always talking about who's now the late Ralph Clemente unfortunately um when he ran the the, the, the film program as I said we, we would work on a number of shorts and a number of features throughout a year and um it was usually two to three feature films a year and uh maybe three or four shorts it was so it was, it was fairly full-on a fairly packed schedule and often um ralph would get industry professionals involved in these so over the years before i went on the program they'd work with the likes of robert weiss and um uh george romero uh had come in as sort of guest directors um one of the features that I worked on uh, very early with Valencia was a film called The First of May, which starred again now, sadly, or, or late um, people who have died since. But it starred uh, J uh, Julie Harris, who was a, a Tony Award winning actress that had appeared in in The Haunting and appeared alongside um, James Dean in East of Eden and whatever. I got the, the pleasure to work with her. Oh, okay. Um, Charles Nelson Riley, Mickey Rooney, you, you know, you know some, 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 some fairly decent and impressive names of, of, of as I said, actors from the, the golden era that are no longer with us. Um, but anyway, um, so the summer after I'd graduated was coming. So this was the, 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 the same, the same group of, um, students that had helped me on overpass and what happened was uh i think the summer film that they had booked for for whatever reason through money or scheduling or something didn't happen um you, you know there was a gap in the schedule and what happened is i was racking my brain trying to remember where i found out about this um but there was there there was a group of 
students at a uh, again, I want to get my facts right, but I think it was it was another university. Um, it may have been in Gainesville, uh, another part of Florida, that were looking for a director uh, to direct a feature film. Okay, and I thought, ah, sod it, why not? And I applied for it, and obviously I sent a copy of Overpass as a, um, uh, you, you know, a sort of demo reel, if you like, to show what I'd previously done. Um, and these guys agreed to, to to a meeting with me, so I, I drove down to to see them, and um, it was it, they were basically there was eight of them, four guys and four girls. Uh, all much younger than me. They 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 were they were still teenagers or, or very early twenties. I think the oldest one might have been about twenty one or twenty two, but the youngest was probably eighteen or nineteen. Right. And they were uh, students of uh, literature and performance. So they were essentially they were actors, but they were writers as well. And um, you know, I think it's fair to say. Um, I, I don't think I'm, I'm I'm out of order to say this, but I think they were all uh, from fairly reasonably privileged backgrounds. Okay. No, you're not out of order for saying that. I think uh, I think most people agree that uh, people who can afford, you know, acting school and film school, on most part, do come from affluence. Yes. Not parents. all of us, though, Simon. No, not all. No, no, I know <laughs> not, not everybody. But it's it, it's one of these things where to uh, survive, it helps to have you know rich parents because there's a lot of time when you're not working, and if in order to sort of you know progress in this industry, you you do need to be available at you know at short notice, which a lot of jobs that people do won't allow. Yes, no, absolutely. Um, so, I, so I met with them, and basically, they they had written this this feature long script, which was essentially a load of vignettes um, about various teenage angst. It was a coming of age story, right. and it was called. They called it the Everyday, and the reason they called it the Everyday was these students would all meet and hang out in a cafe called the Everyday Cafe. All right, and. Right. As I said, there were a number of characters um, that they played, um, which uh, dealt with all sorts of issues, um, you know, coming of age issues, life about um, relationship issues, um, you, you know, all of, all of the usual things. And there was there was also a a part of the plot dealt with the the subject of date rape. Okay, so it was you know there, there was something there. And I, you know, they were very enthusiastic, and I met them, and 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 they asked me a lot of questions, and you know, I I'd obviously read this script before I went there, and and I had lots of questions for them, and um, what what happened is they wanted to make uh, this into a feature, and I I don't know, you know, again, it's easy to look back now and point fingers and say, was this a vanity project? Um, I, I don't know whether it was or not from their point of view, but basically they wanted to make this film. Uh, the stipulation was that they were going to star in this film and it was the film that they'd written. They were going to be writers, producers and actors of this film. Okay. Oh, okay. And they had some money um, between them available for this. Not, not a massive amount, but some, I, I, I honestly, I'm not good with budgets and stuff and I can't remember the, the overall figure off the top of my head, but I, I think I would be somewhere in the ballpark if I said around collectively around probably ten thousand dollars. Okay. Okay. Which which is, you know, what isn't a lot of money when we're talking about, you know, film production, as you well know. Uh, especially yeah. at that time. <laughs> so um you know they were looking for a director. They wanted they wanted this. They wanted it to be a very much a creative collaboration. So, you know, they were very they they were very attached to the material because they'd written it. Uh, they were very yeah. attached to the characters that they were going to play, and you know, it was originally done as a stage 
play that they they decided to adapt into a screenplay and make it into a film. And I said to them, well, we okay. I was very blunt with them. I said, okay, this is extremely wordy, guys. You know, um, films are about you know vision. Um, you know what you see. Uh, obviously, what you hear is important as well, but. This was a series, essentially a, a series of monologues and duologues. And I was like, you know, oh, really? how, how the hell am I going to make this work on, on, <laughs> on film? Right. But I'll be honest, I was I was hungry at the time. I just directed a, a short and yeah. I had a bit of time to kill before uh, my, my official work permit was coming through. And I thought to myself, wow, wouldn't this be a great opportunity to jump straight into directing a feature? So um, I'd come up with an idea about it, which, uh, you know, at the time was probably a little bit more unusual than it is saying it now. Uh, oh, God, scarily, you know, 18, 19 years later or whatever it is. Uh, well, where are we? This was 99, 1999. Yeah. Fucking hell. Uh, God, I feel old when I say that. But anyway, um, <laughs> so, uh, you, you know, I, I was I was young then and it was it was an opportunity. And I thought, um, what can I do with this? So what I decided was we would film something where the camera would move a lot. OK, in fact, the camera would virtually not stop moving right. and it would move in and around these uh, duologues, et cetera. Um, but also that I would do something which, you know, people have various um, thoughts about in, in film, but uh, I would, as a stylistic thing for this, break the fourth wall. So I would have, when it came to their monologues, yeah, I would have them looking into a mirror, talking to themselves, um, you, you, you know, doing, doing various um, tricks or whatever to try and you know it brings it outside of reality but at the same time you, you know um uh, break 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 some rules but still keep it within reality to an extent yeah i made monologue triptych which is free monologues oh i've not seen that okay have you not seen primero segundo and tercero no i need to watch this is this on your site yes they are on my site oh blimey how what kind of co-host am I that I haven't seen all your work? That's terrible. <laughs> well, this is the film with Benjamin Green. Uh, the first one's usually referred to as the carrot film because he's chopping up carrots. Right. But the thing is, he talks to the camera. He breaks the fourth wall. The audience is a character within the film because he is always talking to them. Right. So, yeah, I've I've done something similar because um, I've never been a big fan of monologues. Yeah. Um, I remember the stuff that used to be on TV. Yeah. And I used to hate it. Oh, I fucking hated it. And so when I was given these scripts by Ben Woodywis, I, I really liked them uh, because they were, you know, the, the dialogue was really good. And so, you know, I decided to do it, but I wanted to do it in a way where the person wasn't sort of just sitting down and talking to the camera or something you know it wasn't static mm. it was movement yeah, well it's, it's, this is exactly what i what, what my idea yeah. if you like my vision or whatever with this was i was like i need to i need to try and make this the script is what it is you know i hadn't written this um you, you know it, it, the deal was that the script you know and they came with it essentially and i thought well you know right. it's an opportunity so um I'm going to see how I can make this work. All right. Now it transpired from the conversations that we had. And, and you have to remember, I'm obviously condensing sort of months yes. of stuff here into uh, yeah. of something that happened, you know, 15 years ago or whatever it was in, into this. So I, I, I'm, I'm condensing and whatever here, but essentially um, during the conversations, I, I sort of pitched my idea, my vision, how I saw it. Um, and I said to them, let me see, let me go and talk to Valencia and see whether Ralph would be interested in doing this through the film school. Because if you did this through the film school, you would get equipment, you would get uh, crew students, you know, as long as they're learning, as long as, you know, they've got proper roles and whatever. And um, you, you would get a lot of bang for your buck in terms of that. 
And I told them, but, you know, you would be responsible for, um, you know, the, the, the feeding of the, the crew, uh, you know, any, any, any permits or, or locations that we'd have to pay for. Um, and obviously all of the post-production, et cetera, of the film would be, would be down to you guys. Yeah. But, um, but you'd get this in terms of the production. Right. And they were quite excited by this. And it transpired that one of the one of the um, daughters, uh, one, sorry, one of the daughters, one of the girls in it, her, her dad was a, um, a DOP that had worked. OK. Uh, not not too much in drama, not not much to do with film and television, but certainly to do with commercials and, um, you know, corporate videos and, and, and you know, you know, qu- he had quite a lot of experience okay yeah and it was well if 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 he came on as a dop you know this would be an opportunity for him to do some drama stuff and you know he knew his craft i'd, I'd seen his show reel and 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 y- you know that seemed good and i thought well there's there's someone else that will sort of come on for the love of it rather than you know a job or or having to pay or whatever you know because it's, it's this guy's uh, this this girl's father Smart, and whatever yeah. so so that kind of rounded the package off a little bit more so i thought okay the, the next thing i need to do now is go back and talk to ralph <laughs> yeah. so um i got on well with with ralph as, as i said and and obviously we'd we'd done overpass which he had seen finished uh which was unusual by the way uh let me just sort of point out sadly many of these films that i worked on particularly the shorts um yeah i never ever saw because you have to remember the, these these were days things were shot on film film as we've already covered in fact we've already done to death is very expensive in the post production to actually get um processed and transferred and, and finished and all this sort of thing so many of the the films that valencia had, had had done the production on often the the filmmakers would disappear never to be seen again yeah and um yeah y- y- you know and ralph had very little control over 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 that but with with the case of um uh overpass i managed to get it turned around sort of within two or three months of, of of shooting it so that all the students got a copy and saw the film and we had a screening and you, you know all of that sort of stuff so so i was i was sort of on the right foot as far as well i'm a guy that will finish what i start sort of thing yeah so i went yeah. to ralph and i i sort of pitched this to him i said look you know you've got a gap in the summer program i've already worked with this crew you know, we got on quite well. This is an opportunity. You know, do you want to meet these guys? Um, blah, blah, blah. And he did. You know, we, we got them in for a meeting. And to cut a long story short, uh, after much toing and froing and whatever, it was decided that this was going to be that summer's feature um, that I was going to direct, uh, that we were going to use the crew um that we'd used on overpass although many of them were in different crew positions and roles for this particular uh film that uh the girl's father was going to come on as, as dop um and what had happened was obviously you know the film side was expensive particularly with what i was trying to um to achieve and yeah. this was, and I, and I was on the Sony website trying for the life of me, because even though I could remember my film stock and whatever from Overpass, I was trying to remember the format. Basically, Valencia just invested in two, you know, quality, broadcast quality, um, digital cameras. Okay. They right. they weren't it wasn't Digi Beta or anything like that. It was it was aimed at Was it HD? Cam? I think it was yeah, I think it was um the larger format tape of do you remember when like mini D V came out? Well yeah. this was Oh D V Cam. I think it might have been D V Cam. I was trying D-cam, to remember yeah. the exact bloody model and whatever, but basically yeah. they had invested in, in two of these cameras and what this meant was um you, you know, uh, obviously, budget wise, you know, they weren't going to blow the budget in terms of trying to afford film and trying to, to make this no. feature, which was, you know, quite complicated because of what we wanted to try and do. 
on film and it was it was an opportunity to try out this technology and you know what the way i looked at it it directing was directing yeah yeah and uh i was happy with that so i was like okay um this was before this wasn't a solid state or a hard drive medium it was it was a tape medium okay yeah. a digital tape medium and obviously we'd already um about a year earlier moved from nagra over to dat on the on the audio side of things yeah so what we decided to do we crewed it up um we were going to do some of it just because of the amount of uh, of coverage and characters some of the film was going to be done multi camera right now again i'm a little bit old school i kind of like the idea of designing each individual shot and shooting single camera although yeah. there are a lot of you know um benefits uh you know there's pros and cons to both but there are some benefits yeah. to a multi camera it can certainly help in the edit in post production when trying to sort of sync performances up i want to say i mean just while we're on that subject yeah. um I I have the experience of working on like single and uh, multi cam shoots. At the end of the day, they do say yes, you can capture several performances at the same time with multi cam. But I've always find the footage that they produce uninteresting. Mm. It's really difficult to do coverage with multi cam. You know where it's interesting because yeah. you know you, you what you end up having to do is having to light for two cameras yeah. and then also have to um angle each camera so they don't see yeah each no other. i agree and and which actually leads me really nicely into what i decided to do because what i wanted to do as i mentioned i wanted to have this with the camera moving a lot and i thought you know to try and do that multi camera is going to be a fucking nightmare because you're going to end up seeing the other camera you know it's going to restrict us for lights it's going to do, you know do all these things so what i ended up doing um obviously you know the good thing about having two cameras with the college was it kept because everybody in the it, all the students wanted to be on in camera always you know if ever you, you know nobody really wanted to do sound or grip or electric or, or production oh, okay, they all wanted to do camera so this way we were able to have two camera crews yeah but yeah. what i decided to do it was almost like making it a second unit camera in some respects is i decided to mainly shoot one camera but i yeah. have the other guys maybe getting something odd or interesting from an angle without disturbing what i was trying to do with the main camera if that, if that makes oh, sense oh okay i see so you, you were trying so they were doing like pickup kind shots. of i mean they weren't they weren't off like on another area of location or anything yeah but so why, why i say pickup shots so you know you would be filming them doing their monologue yeah. or dual log and this crew would be capturing like you know maybe like a hand movement exactly. or a close up of their face exactly. or you know something that they could capture that wasn't interfering with the the main shift. and i would tell that second camera crew you know if you end up catching crew or or the other camera or whatever it doesn't matter as long as the main camera isn't catching you. So in other words, yeah. I was getting everything I needed from the main camera, but I could go through all of this footage and maybe find something quite interesting to, to cut in. And of course they love that because it meant that that camera operator could be a little bit creative and play around. I mean, mm. within guidelines that I was setting uh, him or her. Um, but, 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 you know, um, it was just kind of an idea to sort of kill two birds with one stone. And um, so, so that was what we were going to do. Um, we crewed it up. Uh, I managed to get a guy that um, that also worked at the college in the theatre department, who was who was quite a um, a positive chap. Decided that he was happy to take on the production manager role and control the budget that they had and kind of do all of that work, which I was delighted at because I didn't really want to be involved in that i wanted to get on and do the directing job and just have the directing hat on in this well i have to say i i mean personally speaking about my feature film i was very glad that i had sam price on board 
because um, having to do all that production management work on my own, as well as directing and producing the film, would have been a nightmare. Yeah. So I was I was very happy to have Sam on board. No, absolutely. So yeah, I know where you're coming from. It's 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 very important. I think a lot of people overlooked that. I mean, with a short film, yeah, you can get away with not having a production manager because you might be shooting for one or two days. But when you're shooting a feature film that's maybe, you know, three weeks, um, you need somebody like that. So how long did you shoot right, for? Right, okay. Well, this was the thing. We had um, we had a little bit of prep, but not loads. I mean, obviously not. You know, the, the rule of thumb is always, ideally, you want two days of pre-production for every day of production, right? <laughs> um we, <laughs> well, we, we you, are, you never get that <laughs> no no i mean i mean that's 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 the sort of hollywood model which you know it's it's hard to get but um yeah we we ended up shooting on this for uh five weeks five five day weeks all right okay so which was which, which was for me bliss i was like oh my god you know uh, over five weeks of 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 doing nothing but directing you know with a with a 30 person crew and you know two cameras and three production trucks and all this sort of thing it was it was fucking awesome you know i was like yay um but this was a very different shoot to overpass meaning that this because because it, not only am i dealing with an ensemble of characters i mean there were eight main characters plus a few others that we had to cast here and there um that, yeah. that obviously i was involved in that bit uh, in fact, there are cameos in it by, well, I, I, I put Ralph in the film. It was no dialogue, but just he was so charismatic. I, I thought he can play this one role. And I took two of the three actors from Overpass and put them in small parts as a sort of in-joke okay. for me, an Easter egg thing. And, and what, a thank the you. couple? Uh, no, actually not. It was Max and, and the girl. Uh, unfortunately, oh, the okay. guy uh, who played Nick wasn't available at the time we shot oh, this he was on another project somewhere so oh, okay. um so i managed to get them in it and um but you know this 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 film involved multiple locations both indoors and outdoors okay so there was a lot of locations on this unfortunately i had a, a location manager um yeah as part of the crew that we worked on but one of the things i was really pleased about is um you know, the idea of this film, I mean, the, the, these kids, they were all a bit sort of arty and, and they, 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 they were a bit arty and hip or, or a bit, um, you know, university. And, you know, there, there was all this stuff going on. And, and obviously there was, this was all about angst and teenagey stuff and, and coming of age. And I thought, you know what, I really need this to look I, I need this to, to, to have a bit of a cool factor going on in places. Right? Okay. Oh, yeah, especially back in the 90s. That 90s, it was all about the cool, wasn't it? Exactly. So what I, what I managed to um, find and secure and I was delighted about is there was a, a, a bar near the college in Orlando called Java Javas. And it was J- Jabba Javas, right? And it was, okay. and it was a, a, a cool coffee bar bar. Uh, open mic night poetry reading arty fart place yeah um and it had loads of original painted artwork on the walls that you could buy it was one of those sort of places so it was it was loads of it was dimly lit loads of couches a bar you know they served they served cappuccinos they served out wait a minute wait a minute did you make slacker? <laughs> there, there you go. Yeah. <laughs> Is that what you were making? You sure it wasn't no, released? Only. You sure? You sure somebody they didn't slip it over to um, the director of slacker? Yeah, if only, eh? Um, Richard Linklater. Yeah. And they go, look, look at this. Well, film. Actually, I'm glad you said that because I kind of wanted a bit of a Linklatery vibe for this. So anyway, yeah. So I found this. Well, look, I mean, from what you've told me, it sounds like slacker. Yeah. All right. Well, it, it absolutely sounds like Slacker, which would have been a big influence back then because it was uh, 91 when that film yeah, came out. Yeah. All right. Well, I mean, um, I wasn't sort of directly um, coming off of that. So I, I found this I found this uh, cool, uh, you know, you know, bar place. And the good thing with it was I said, look, 
I need this place to be this everyday cafe where this fucking where they hang out where this shit goes on yeah, yeah? and i wanted this <laughs> and i fucking? wanted this place to be it yeah but the, okay. the other cool thing with this is is i wanted as much visual stuff going on as possible and this was the place you could really sort of go to town with lighting i mean they had a light board and you know loads of hung lights and gels and all this sort of thing so you could do some really interesting stuff dop was fucking loving this by the way yeah oh, but course. the other thing i could get that really helped me was i managed to get a blanket release for all of the artwork on the on the walls oh nice which was nice yeah. because i remember there was one with these weird eyes and i was able to do something where i started on the eyes of the picture and the camera came down on a jib to the eyes of one of the characters and you know in all sorts of transitiony things and whatever like that and i wanted to wow. keep I, i'm i'm kind of feeling a bit generous um not generous, uh, jealous of the fact that you had access to all these toys. Well, yeah, I did. And I mean, you, you know, and, and without wanting to toot my horn too much myself, but I, I did actually work fucking hard on this, right? Which is why oh, which is why this whole story I'm telling you is a little bit of a bittersweet story for me, unfortunately, because of how it all turned out. But um yeah. but uh but a great a great lesson none the same. Um so, you know, I'd managed to get this as a sort of central location that we were having and we managed to film. I was saying, like, there was one bit where I was like, um, how about, well, you know, th there was this thing where there were these four guys, four, the four guys in it, chatting. And I was like, well, this is kind of boring. I said, what about if you four guys were in a band and you were at a jamming session and you're each on an instrument and you had the conversation. I said, you don't need to be able to play. You know, we can fake all that shit. But, you know, you're at a jamming session and, and, and we get. So I was trying to come up with all these things to make this visual and interesting. Yeah. And, and yeah. you know, we managed to set up a um, had access to a lot of musicians and managed to set up uh, in the in the black box theater at the college, because obviously I could use anything on campus, which was great. And I was like, well, let's look at, you know the whole guerrilla filmmakers thing let's look at what i've got access to and what i can use and exploit and sprinkle in the film yeah so yeah, yeah. you know there, there was there was band equipment and there was a a, a big theater so uh, and we we had round dolly tracks so i was like fucking hell you know we could put the band in the middle of this and go all the way around while they're having these conversations and, and of course the actors loved all this because it was making them look like fucking cool musicians and all this shit right yeah so um so we did that um so we had a few locations sorted and it was it was great because it was one of these one of these scenarios where um, basically I would spend the weekends uh, organizing my my shot lists and um, all of my planning for for the next week. And I would take it a week at a time, obviously knowing where I was going all the way through. But I'd I, yeah. I, I'd use the the weekends before each shoot to really focus and, and do that. And I'd visited all the locations. So I, 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 you know, been, been there with the DOP and I'd sort of explained what shots that I was thinking of and what we could do. And he was totally enthusiastic. I mean, he was, he was, you know, he's quite a bit older than me. Um, but he understood, you, you, you know, he could see that I was passionate. He could see that I kind of, had some inkling of, of the craft and un understood certain things. And he, he, he liked what I was trying to do about making this, this wordy, you know, um, script, which could have been, you know, a master and over the shoulders of loads of people, you know, sat around yeah. talking and I tried to do something a bit different with it. So we did that. Yeah. The other thing you, you try to make it more visual. Exactly. The other thing that was very different to overpass was, um, as I'd mentioned, we shot overpass at night and it was bloody freezing in, in, in March of Florida, <laughs> right? By the time we were shooting this, this was the height of summer in Florida and we were shooting days. Uh, well, I mean, right. there were some night shoots, but a lot of days in the park and stuff like that. So there was lots of sunscreen and mosquito repellent and stuff going on during this <laughs> shoot. You know, it was it was a fairly you know, tough shoot in terms of, in yeah. terms of that sort of thing. But I was trying to get a lot of mileage, a lot of bang for the buck. Um, you, you know, I found some really beautiful locations outdoors where I could, where I could film stuff. We had to do a little, there was one thing where I had to get sort of a stunt advisor involved because one of the characters who can't swim and is set up is not being able to swim 
has to sort of face his fear. And one of the things he does is he goes out onto a lake in a canoe and the canoe capsizes. Yeah. So, right, if, so yeah. again, I, I, I was trying to get some, you know, interesting photography and whatever, of course, being very careful with these new cameras that the college had just invested in <laughs> and whatever, but yeah. filming on a lake and filming in a park and doing all this, doing all this stuff. And, and you know, the shoot, I really enjoyed it. Um, it, it, it went, you know, to plan some weeks and, and, you know, we had the odd days of disasters, but those were good things because they made me think on my feet and, and learn as a director. And, and one of the things I'm always saying, if somebody gets stuck, you know, when I was teaching, this is why I was saying it was important to have a, a shot list. Even if you don't stick to the shot list, it's important to have a plan, have an idea, have an idea of how, see the film in your head have an idea of how you want to edit, have an idea of how you're going to transition because these sort of things can get you out of jail if there's a problem, right? At the end yeah. of the day, you have to say, what do I need to tell this story? Yeah, there's always shots that you'd like to have, but if the shit hits the fan, what do I need to tell the story? The show must go on. And I remember we... The other thing, the other thing I'm just going to add yeah. as well is that when you're in the middle of it, you don't have time. Is the thing you you are now there's there's a clock oh yeah and it's running out and you've got to get the shots or otherwise you have no film or you or that scene doesn't happen in the film because you don't get it so any planning you should do beforehand because even if as you say if you don't use it at least there's something to fall back on yeah because there's nothing worse than somebody just stand people asking what we're going to do what we're going to do uh, i don't know no exactly um, yeah. well there was this one day where we had an apartment it was an apartment scene and it was um it was it, three three of the characters they had this scene in the apartment and i had i had my shot sort of planned and there was you know there was some coverage and there were some overs and you know there was all this sort of stuff going on and unfortunately the the location guy came in in absolute bits and i was like what's wrong and he's like oh oh i don't get it i'm being told we can't shoot here now and we've got to be out of here in you, you, you know within the hour and you, you oh, know and all this shit. sort of thing and and, yeah. and you know it was a bit of an old shit moment but i thought okay fair enough so i said to the dop what we'll do then uh, i said we'll do this whole scene as a wanna and i said right. what we'll do is i remembered i was trying to do some clever things with transitioning yeah and I remember right, yeah. the scene that ended before this, I had ended up on a glass, right? So I, I okay. put a glass on the counter at one end of this, this apartment, right? And I said, so we'll start off on this. And then I set, I asked them to set a piece of curved dolly track. And I said, and we'll end. And I knew the next scene was going to cut to a guy coming through the door. And you had to think, so I said, and we'll end with you. Go. So what I basically did, I said, right, we've got to be out of here in an hour. So I said, let's 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 just light it you know so we can go fairly wide i said let's set up just one bit of curved track here i i said to the actors right while they're setting that up i'm gonna block this with you so it makes sense so you're not talking to each other so we got some movement going on in this frame and by the end of it you're going to have started over here and end up by the door and go out the door and that's where we're going to end it right so the dop yeah. was all on board with this you know we had to move i suggested to the sound guys that because uh, what i want to say about this is even though this technology we had now, you could actually record the sound directly onto the tape. What we decided yeah. to do, because obviously it's part of learning as well in film school, is we still recorded separately to DAT and slated everything just like you would a proper yeah. movie. And the the, the, the the audio that was on the tape was just going to be used as a guide track for rushes and 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 things of that nature right so um yeah which we do now which, which yeah, we do with these digital slrs exactly. is we we never sort of use the on board camera stuff we use uh separately recorded because there's usually no way of getting um a mixer 
into the camera. Yeah, no, exactly. Unless, of course, you're shooting something like a C100 or above. The mix, exactly. But, so, but you still still try and keep the sound separate. No, absolutely. So, uh, you know, I, 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 I suggested that we probably got them radio mic'd for this scene because we, we weren't going to have time, you know, to sort of deal with oh, boom God, and yeah. shadows and wide and all this sort of stuff. So so they did that, and I, and I rehearsed with the actors so that the scene made sense and looked right and blocked. And, uh, and you know... That's what we did. We started on this glass and we cut to the guy in, behind the kitchen bar thing and they were talking and with the camera was moving the whole time and they have this little confab and they end up leaving and we end up on the door as it opens, yeah, and all this sort of right, thing. Yeah. So I had my scene and we were out of there. We didn't piss off the location. We, we were out of there. But essentially it was a, a scene that I had like half a day booked for, you know, with shots yeah. and all these sort of things I was going to do that basically I had to con- – condense into a, a one shot that we we shot it within an hour yeah and it worked and and it, and it was and you know everybody was happy but for me this was great learning because this was me yes in at the deep end having to think on my feet having to be a mature about it and and real world so instead of instead of losing my fucking rag at the location manager about why hadn't he got the fucking permit and all this i thought it's not even worth that let's just use what we've got and tell the story so Oh yeah, it's it's a good exercise in sort of uh, compromise because sometimes you know you have it sort of all figured out in your brain. You have all these shots that you want to do. You want to sort of do this angle, that angle. But when it comes down to it, to the day, you may only have a short amount of time where you know you you you've only got enough time to get these shots. So you you know you came up with a brilliant way of doing it. Yeah, and also I, I don't know about you, but I personally like it when a film does use longer takes you know because then it because you have to do it in an interesting way yes yeah you can do it as a static but you you know you want to sort of move the camera with them and stuff i mean this is the thing with spielberg he's he is kind of like a master of the one yes oh absolutely absolutely i like a whole jaws thing is amazing (laughs) yeah so but i mean he also knows to shoot other stuff just in case the one is not working that he can cut into yeah. but um no i mean that was a, a brilliant solution to that problem yeah and i mean my whole mantra for this was to try and keep the camera moving as much as possible anyway so if it, it yeah. fitted the the overall image of the film as well the aesthetic if you like so uh you know i was happy and and i knew i could make the transitions work and all this sort of thing so we did that and i mean we shot we shot all sorts of places and it was a real you know, for me, it was an absolute joy because because I had a crew. I mean, you know, this was a big luxury. I had, you know, 30, 30 people as a crew or whatever, plus, you know, people at the office doing stuff and, book, you know, sorting out locations for the next week. And I had a 25 day shoot. So, I mean, you, you, you know, you know, this this would this was heaven and it would be the, you know, yes, I had to drive one one of the trucks but i had to be the first person there anyway so if i drove the generator truck it kind of made sense because the generator would be on the location ready for us to um you you know ready for the crew to set up so we could we could have lights and whatever so you 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 know it, it all made sense and it was it was great and i would turn up and you know i i i'd have somebody bring me like i'll never forget in the morning i'd turn up and somebody would bring me a black coffee, a banana and a peanut butter bagel. And I was like, fucking <laughs> hell, I've made it. What the fuck? You know? And then, you know, it was great. So, but I got to work, I yes. got to work with these actors, these young actors. Um, it all went, as I said, we had a few little production problems along the way that we dealt with and that was fine. Yeah. Um, work, the crew were great. Uh, you know, most of them pulled their weight. The people who were in the key positions really sort of stepped up to the plate and helped me. Um, don't think anybody got too fucked off from, from what I can remember, but obviously I, you know, I was, I was pretty busy. Um, for me, it was a joy. Some, some days were more stressful than others, depending on the location, um, and, and, and things of that nature. But, you know, there was a lot of variation. There was day, day yeah. stuff, there were indoors, there was exterior, there was night stuff, there was all sorts of, and there were a lot of characters and a lot of character changes. And, you, you, you know, I, I had a continuity person, a script supervisor, so we were keeping all the notes and everything, even though we were shooting this on on digital video, right? 
everything was treated like a proper production. So all of the all of the camera reports related to the tapes and as if it was filmed, basically. And, you know, I circled which tapes were good and, um, y- y- you know, any changes and stuff were noted. So, you know, you know I know I had a film here. This is this is Brilliant. this is where it can I ask? Can yeah, I go. Ask, um, so at the end of it, how did you feel? Oh, I loved it. I'll never forget the last day, um, the last time I had to say action, my heart sank because I was so sad that it was the end. So that's how much I loved it. I mean, <laughs> I, 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 I have to say I had the opposite. I was quite relieved it was. Oh, over. really? Oh, OK. Yeah, oh, well, well, yeah. I'm sure we'll get to that in a future podcast. Oh, right? in, indeed. But I mean, um I also felt exhausted. Oh, as well. I mean, I, I was absolutely fucking yeah. I mean, I was young and and healthy and in good shape and whatever back then. But uh, but yeah, I was I was knackered and um, but but I loved it. And uh, y- you know, it's weird. I've never. This is sort of coming out. I mean, I'm sure I've forgotten loads of stuff. This is I've never it's I've never fine. talked about it before. So this is kind of like a first time. It's it's kind of it, it's uh cathartic almost you know it's like to sort of talk about it but the thing is sadly um this is a bittersweet story because what 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 ended up happening ultimately and um you you, you know uh, i don't mean any any bad will against any of these people involved but what happened was um we finished the film uh there was a lot of footage it was um uh you know i i had notes i had i had edit lists i had uh everything ready i had ideas about what to do with grade and what to do with sound and 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 you know all sorts of stuff and of course um y- y- you know some months went by uh I ended up my work permit came through and you know I started working and 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 I moved across to to Los Angeles as you do and you know did some work with with Nutter and you know various various things there but all the time I was kind of like on these kids saying um you know what what are your plans then for the post production you know what what are you what are you going to ah, do right. what what's your plan cuz you know they were responsible for that and that was in the contract they'd signed with Valencia and everything yeah and I was like uh you know, um, I, I, who who are we going to find a an editor that we can work with? Um, you know, at this point, I wasn't working. Uh, my internship at Vaughan had finished, so I didn't have access to the Avid that they had there. But I said, you know, I might yeah. be able to do something. You know, did it, and I was very keen to get this finished. You know, so that the uh, the students could see it, and that well, you know, I was hoping it would sort of be the thing to lead me to the next. Um, junction in my career as it were and I wanted to show Nutter you know I'll be honest I wanted you know all this stuff and what happened was as I said it was it was kind of a a really you know it went from a really happy time making the film to then life you know and I don't want this whole podcast thing to be a total downer but um basically uh my you know you know we're we're moving forward like a, a year had passed yeah my my work visa was coming to an end. Um, I, yeah. I'd obviously tried the sort of Hollywood lawyer thing to try and get a new permit, so that was all coming to the to an end. So I had to leave, you know, what I was doing with with it, Paramount with Nutter and whatever, and um, come back. So I, I I came back to Florida where a lot of my stuff was still in storage, and um, right. uh, the tapes, uh, the footage was still sat at at um valencia it was still in there it oh, was right. still in their uh, vault at valencia oh shit sure. so, and i said so I, I said well i'm gonna have to you know go to go back to england um you know why why don't i take this footage with me you know why don't we get it shipped back to england and when i'm in england i'll see if i can find a uh, editor or something over in the UK that we can get this finished with. Now, this this was where, and I don't know why, but where the relationship with with this group of a cer- certainly a couple of this group of a anyway yeah. changed because they were like their view on it, and I kind of get it, I suppose. Was oh shit, 
this guy's about to, you know, leave the country and go back over to, to the UK. And, uh, you know, we, we've, we've invested whatever it was, 10, let's say $10,000 for argument's sake in this film, you know, which is, it's there on those tapes. If, if, if he leaves with those tapes, then he's leaving with our film and we might never see it again. So they said, no, 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 we're going to come to the college and, and collect the tapes. So I was right. like, okay. So I said, no, nah, nah, and I, you know, at the end of the day, this was their property. And my, my, my part of the contract was only to come in and direct it. It wasn't like I had like final cut or any, anything like that. I mean, I didn't get, obviously I didn't get paid to do this. Uh, I took it as an opportunity and a privilege to get to what, I mean, technically I got paid for driving the trucks or whatever, but you know, I wasn't getting paid to make this film. And, you know, and I was a bit naive, well, I still am to a certain extent about contracts and rights and all that sort of shit. Yeah. And um, so when they when they came, I said not all of them showed up. See, the thing is that the eight of them had been involved in everything. Right. Plus the yeah. DOP, the dad. But when it came to collecting the film, only a couple of them came and i said oh, oh um right. so i said look uh you know i'm still here for a little while are we gonna have a uh a, a meeting a, a com conversation about this because you know time is time has moved on a bit and um i said you know i know ralph would probably be keen to have a debrief on this and uh you know want to know sort of what the next step is uh, you know and they said well you know at the end of the day this is our film keith you know you directed it and great we're, we're grateful but you know, you, do, you don't own these tapes. And I'm, and I'm saying, well, I'm not saying I own the tapes. I'm saying that um, I want to get the film finished and I'm happy to, you know, see that through. I'm telling you now that I will, I'm about getting things finished. I will, I will do this for you, you know. Uh, and I said, well, is there any way we can, we can make copies of the tapes and I'll take the copies and do like a sort of rough cut or something. And, get you an edit decision list back or anything like that and they said oh you know no we, we, we really have no money now we, we we spent all of our money on the production and you know it's a fatal mistake that everybody makes still we left no yeah. money for post-production or, or distribution or festivals or anything yeah so I was like okay you know and I sort of warned them at the beat I was a bit annoyed because in the early conversations, I'd said all this stuff, you know, the big, the yes. big know all that yeah. I am. Yeah. But I, I'd sort of said all this stuff to them and I was like, okay, you know, so it all got a bit weird really, because I, I had to leave the country, which, you know, I'm not going to go into too much personal stuff about that, but you know, this was a big deal for me. And it was, it was a, a, a real, a real anti-climax really to sort of trying to go and follow the American dream. Yeah. Um, you know, I, I'd done everything by the book, but sadly that was the law and, you know, I, I, I had to go. Um, but I directed this feature, which, you know, I'd spent five weeks on uh, actually uh, of my life on set, but then, you know, another four or five weeks or a couple of months or whatever beforehand trying to get the deal done with Valencia and pitching to the guys and, planning and getting locations and you know doing a lot of work and I had a lot of help I'm not going to say it was all me 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 you know um and again, but these guys you know I was like well what's going to happen with it now so they said oh you know well we'll, we'll stay in touch and and I gave them I had all of my I gave them copies of all of my director's notes and my edit decision notes and the continuity right. sheets or the script supervision stuff everything so i said look you've got there's no reshoots needed you've got everything here you can tell this story here's my noted script you know annotated script um here here are the script supervision notes you know th th this is this is ready to be edited this can be done you know so they were yeah. like okay so they they went and then of course i moved back to england and um you have to remember this was this was you know uh well Two, year 2000 or 2001 whatever and um you, you know you know what we're doing now recording this podcast you know we didn't have skype and and facetime and you know all these great things that we've got now yeah so in terms of keeping in touch with them it was it was largely 
an expensive international phone call or, you know, the odd email, you know, that would get read at some point, not again, not to the yeah. extent that we're reading them on our phones on an hourly <laughs> basis and all this shit now, you know, so yeah. it's a different time, oh, yeah. you know, hard to get hold of these guys. Cause, um, you, you, you know, they were either, uh, working or, or still studying and, and, you, you know, it was really busy. So, um, it was pretty hard to keep in touch with them, uh, once I'd moved back to England. And of course, you, you know, there were eight of them. So uh, I used one of the guys. He sort of kept in touch with me and we had international phone calls um, probably for about a, another six months or so. Uh, it was always the same news. It was always, well, you know, we're all working. We're trying to get some money together so that we can <clears throat> get an editor on board and and you know start looking at post production and things like that but uh, eventually those those calls stopped and um y- y- you know I lost touch with these guys uh completely um they did they did at one point send me a again after me sort of hounding them uh for this they did send me a VHS uh tape um, which was a trailer that, that somebody had put together for it. Um, and, you know, e- even that was, was massively disappointing because right. it, it, it was a trailer that uh, didn't really say much about what the film was about. Uh, I mean, don't get me wrong, I don't like trailers that, that, that sort of give away everything, uh, like some of our uh, summer blockbusters <laughs> oh, do sometimes, God. which drives me nuts. Yeah, but, um, especially this summer. Exactly. But, uh, but you, you know, th- this really didn't sort of give a feel for the film or anything. Um, it, it, you know, it, th- there were some beautiful shots in it. I mean, I was very happy about how some of the shots looked, but it was largely just sort of shots of each character with some music over the top and, y- you know, shots of the locations and stuff, but did didn't really tell you much. And of course, I mean, you know, I, I don't, I don't completely blame these guys because I, I just think they just didn't know. But nowhere on there was there any credit of, um, you know, Valencia College, uh, you know, the film program that, that, that basically allowed them to, to get this done. There was no credit for Ralph, you, you know. That, and the thing that w- was a real insult, uh, really, I mean, I, I guess I'm letting ego go because my name is nothing, but... At the very end, it said a film by Food Stamp Productions, which was their production company name. Oh, and I sort of thought to myself, bastards. really? You know, so, I mean, I have to dig. I've probably got this tape somewhere um, in, a, in a box somewhere. I, I guess I should dig it out and digitize it at some point. But um, So do you wish you'd taken those tapes now? Well, you know, I mean... You know, I was, I guess, young and naive at the time, and I was trying to do the right thing. Uh, at the end of the day, they had paid for this production. You know, I mean, okay, I'd got them a lot of free stuff, obviously, but they they paid for the production, and it was their property. Um, you know, to to a certain point of view, obviously, the the me having to fairly abruptly leave America. Um, was a bit of a surprise i mean you know it was a surprise to me so it was probably a surprise to them i i I, you know again naively thought that um that i could extend my my work permit and stay out there uh which was plan a um keith looking back on it now do you wish you had taken the tapes well yeah i mean simply because the the the, and the reason you, you know like i said um uh this is the first time i've ever really talked about this in 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 uh in those years that have gone by since is because, um, you you know, I'm very much one for, in fact, I get very annoyed, um, with, with, uh, people who don't sort of finish filmmakers that, that, you know, cause I've worked on dozens over the years of films that you never ever see anything of, uh, not even sometimes not even a rough cut, you know, I I know me too. Me too. And, and, and I'm a big, you, you know, all my shorts, uh, right from Overpass, um, right the way up to date, I always make sure, you, you know, get finished and get, and get 
copies to to the casting crew and get a screening somewhere i've been a bit you know i am rubbish with um with festivals and and stuff like that that's an area that um that i've definitely got to improve at i've I've obviously had a stab at it but i'm not very good at that yeah well Um, i mean just sort of briefly talking about the festival thing i mean i find that you know you 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 start off with a lot of enthusiasm and you send it out to all all over the place and then you get into none and yes then, and that kind of it does deflate your bubble and the fact that you probably had to pay for most of them to be i was entered, gonna say is expensive Absolutely. very expensive. An expensive and it gets process. even more expensive if it's a feature film yeah and you you just find that it's um a lot of the festivals pick up films that you know are by known filmmakers who are studio behind them or friends with the festival or they have a star in it or you know there's all these sort of different it's, it's sometimes they're really weird factors why your film won't get picked yeah you know and it, it could be like you have you've ticked every box you've got somebody famous in there you're known by the festival and it just happens the film you make doesn't fit their program it's just it's really one of these weird things so when a film is like a a festival darling it's you know it's only like one out of a thousand that ever happens no absolutely absolutely but i mean you know to answer your question um yes of, of course i would love to um i would love to have something to show for this because you 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 know there was definitely a film there uh, whether you know, I wouldn't be arrogant enough to say whether it was a good film or not. But there was a film there. I, I you know, I did all my work as a director, meaning um, I had viewed all of the uh, rushes or, or dailies, as they tend to call them in the US, um, for, for everything we shot every day. You know, um, that's part of the director's job, and I'd gone through it, and there was enough material and 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 takes to tell that story. So um, I know they had a completed film there. There wasn't a need for any sort of uh, additional reshoots or, or, or anything like that. Everything, everything sort of worked, it, it, you know, in so much as it did. Um, and, uh, you know, the, the, the sad thing is that that's, you know, I, I just think of it now that uh, though it sat somewhere on obsolete, an obsolete medium <laughs> uh, degrading and um you, you know never to see the light of day and i mean the sad thing is the window is missed now as well because it was a film you know very much of its time um so you know we were talking you know mobile phones with antennas and keypads <laughs> and and, and yes. computers with with chunky screens and and things of that nature so i mean it's not like oh it could suddenly get you know if by some miracle those guys heard this podcast and uh and, and you know, we 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 suddenly revived it or anything. Um, you you know, that's pretty unlikely. And I mean, I've I've tried to find these guys. Um, you know, if if I Google the everyday film, I find a film by Michael Winterbottom. Right. Yeah. <laughs> and if I Google food stamp productions, that's a music production company that specialise in rap and hip hop. So so um so so so, so you know that. They're not out there, and you know, obviously, these guys now would be in in their thirties, I guess. You know, so yeah. um, you know, I, I hope they've all obviously um, graduated and got lives and got careers and and got married and had families and and are happy. You know, but uh, <laughs> but sadly, and and the other thing is, obviously, because because I was caught a little bit by surprise when they um, when they came to collect the footage and. Mm. I gave over all my notes and everything. Yeah. I don't have any of that. So literally the only thing I've got apart from this, you know, somewhere on a VHS, this, this not very good trailer that they sent me uh, that doesn't even have my name on it. But, um, you, you know, the only other thing I've got is, is fortunately the photographer, the onset photographer who, um, who was one of the students at the college did give me a copy of the of the prints of the photographs obviously this oh, okay. was filmed so that they're, they're just prints of this and somewhere at home you know i i've got behind the scenes photos from all this stuff um and you know sort of cast and crew photos and all that but, the, but that's it you know um and the reason i don't mention it you know i know you you've said to me why don't you talk about this why don't you plug this is because you, you, you know it it could to anyone else, anyone who doesn't know me or whatever, just sound like total bullshit on my part because there isn't there isn't a finished product, there isn't a film, 
which is very sad. Um, you know, I got to experience obviously the 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 pre-production and the production of this, but but sadly, you know, no post was done on it at all. And um, uh, you, you know, I mean, I, I I look back the things I took from it. Um, I mean, it was a learning experience. I was very fortunate. I mean, I got to. I've never ever had the luxury of the time and uh, resources that I had for this. You know, I, I had 25 days of, of, of shooting, um, which is a lot compared to what I've been used to on anything else. Okay, we had a, there were a lot of locations and logistics and, and obviously characters in this film, so it was still, you know, there's never enough time, is there? So we were still pushed, but you know, I had the luxury of, of, of that time. I also had the luxury of a, you know, 30 person crew, um, production trucks, generators, you know, HMI lights, uh, you know, all, all, all of that good stuff. So, you know, you know, I had the experience of working like a, a director that's, that, that, that's on a, well, almost a small, you know, independent Hollywood production or whatever, <laughs> you know, so I value that. When I say you should, you know not uh, when i say talk about it i don't mean like you know um like we're talking about now but i mean you sh you should have it on your cv you know you directed a feature film and there's uh, we don't know many people who have you know yeah, yeah. you know I, I know there isn't a finished product but you still directed the feature film what happened to it wasn't your fault it was down to the guys who were running the production they could have finished the film and they decided not to for whatever reasons. Well, they were young, they were young and naive and, and y you know, it was, it was, I mean, I, I felt bad for the college um, and for Ralph because, okay, we had a lot of shorts and whatever that we never yeah. ever saw, but most a of the features, film, yeah. yeah, most of the features got finished and got a screening and even got some form of distribution. Um, yeah. And, you know, sadly, that crew that had been, you know, the guys and girls on that crew that had helped me on uh, my first, you know, short overpass and obviously worked very hard on this for me, or most of them worked hard anyway. Um, you, you know, they, they never got to see, well, they, they got the learning experience, but that was where that ended. And uh, obviously, Ralph, you, you know, it was a, another one that um, he made happen. But, but 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 didn't you know get screened at the Valencia Film Festival or anything like that? So yeah, uh, when I, which I would have obviously loved, gotcha. yeah, big time. But um, but you know I got to learn a lot on it, um, and uh, you, you know it, it was, I mean everything that sort of followed it was a little bit of a uh, again I don't want to be too much of a downer on these podcasts, but it was a a bittersweet time in in my life because. You know, that particular era, that particular chapter ended for me. I came back to the UK. Um, you know, I've been struggling ever since <laughs> I came back to the UK. It took me some years to to, uh, to sort of get on. And, you know, I went back to studying and I started studying, you know, directing and producing. And I studied um you know, screenwriting and film theories. And I, I, you know, I carried on and of course acting and, and, you know, things of that nature, but it, it, it took me uh, a long while, you know, some years before I actually decided to direct something again. And obviously everything I've done has been in the most part self-funded on, on, on extremely small budgets. So with very little time or money or resources like I had back then, you know, they, they've all been sort of very small, um, you, you know, half a dozen size crews, <laughs> you, you, you know, and, and, and things of that nature. So it, it, it's, it's been very different, but, you know, I've obviously followed my mantra and made sure that, um, that everything that I have done and got involved in, on the, on the creative side like that has been finished and um you, you know and, and and you know I, I you say about envy simon i mean i'm i'm envious of you your your um your feature that you made i know, i know you've been through this which i'm sure we'll get on to in future podcasts but at the end of the day you've got in fact i have a copy of it you've got a dvd 
you, you know, with the film on and, and extras and all this sort of thing, you've got it available on demand, you, you, you know, and that's what I consider an achievement would be having that. The fact that, as I said, I've got a, a, um, a few old yeah. photographs from behind the scenes <laughs> and, 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 a, and a trailer that doesn't have my name on it, you know, yeah. that I didn't edit. Well, um, I, I will say I, I'd love <laughs> to see these photographs. Yeah, yeah. Well, I'm gonna have to dig them out at some point. Yeah. As I said, they're they're all. I've got nothing digital. It's all uh, it's all old school analog. I'm afraid. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, yeah. Um, so yeah, that 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 was that. But it was, um, you know, uh, as I said, the actual production of it itself. You know, it had its ups and downs, like any production does. And but. And the most part, I just have happy memories about that because I really got to enjoy, you know, trying to figure out how to tell this story because it wasn't my story. It was their story. And I had to make it, um, you know, work and make it cinematic. And uh, one of the things I mean, you, you know, I'm a bit of a self-deprecating guy. I know on, on these podcasts and stuff, <laughs> and I used to get told off about this quite a bit. <laughs> and I don't, I, I don't tend to sort of blow Who my tells own. you off. Oh, ex girlfriends used to get really annoyed with me about this. But oh, anyway, okay. uh, you, I, I won't say any more. You know who I am. Yeah, I, I um, know, I know. But, uh, but I, uh, you know, one thing I will blow my trumpet on because this, this is always stuck with me is that is the director of photography on this, who obviously was a lot older than me at the time, and um, you know had worked on a lot of stuff, even though he'd not sort of done anything particularly commercial um and well known you, you know he definitely knew his craft and had been on a lot of shoots he he said to me uh at the end of it through no prompting from me i wasn't fishing or anything he said to me i have to say for for a young and he called me a first time director i mean it was the first feature yeah first time director i was one of the most organized and imaginative guys he'd have ever worked with and he said you knew I knew what I wanted and I had a vision and uh you know I took that as a massive compliment and um you, you, you know uh this this is the th and you know I'd done my homework I had worked hard on this and this is what I what I don't get with some directors that I've worked with is you know not on a professional level but on a sort of um uh, you, you know, independent film level is, is you, you know, I know there's different types of director and, and we all talk about, you know, the, the, the theory of directing three films, you know, one when you're planning, whatever. but, but yeah, but no, I, I, I always, I always get, I always get uh, kind of pissed off when, when the director doesn't know, know what they're doing, you know, hadn't kind of, planned anything or, or or sort of edited it in their head or used any imagination and and you know i don't get it because to me that's that's what directing is you know so. yeah there's there's some bad edit uh, sorry bad editors bad directors out there you know and it's you know you, you at the end of the day if, if they're not prepared i mean I, there's, there's some guys who you know they let the crew do everything and just sort of you know take all the glory and there's other guys who, you know, they come on the set and you go, right, what do you want to do? Uh, and er uh, is not what you want to hear. You want to hear, right, well, we'll start with a wide shot and we'll, you know, uh, block the actors. And, you know, you have to have a plan. Yeah. At the yeah. end of the day, those people, they're going to fall by the wayside. Well, I, th I think the idea, you know, I think a lot of people who sort of sort of fancy themselves as directors or whatever out there, um, you know, not don't necessarily realise exactly how much work it is because that that that's that's the real heartbreak about about this film yeah. was the fact that um i have nothing to show for it i have you know knowledge and experience and things i learned from it but i have nothing to show for it yet in terms of the prepping and the production i mean i worked my bloody ass off you know i i you know these were 20 hour days for me by the time i'd you know um organize things in the morning and check footage in the evening and uh, you, you, you know and obviously was prepping at the weekend for the next uh week shoot and all this sort of thing and you, you know that is the job and and it doesn't end there i mean obviously i was prepared to work hard in the post-production 
phase as well but um you know sadly uh never yeah, got that and yes yeah. you know in hindsight i wish i'd just gone ahead and got all the tapes copied and brought them back to england and found an editor and bloody done something with it yes of course i do <laughs> and i think that's i think that's a, a good point to finish yes oh yeah i mean i could witter on for ages about this there's a lot of <laughs> stories involved around it but essentially that 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 is what happens at least from my my memory and my recollection of it which um you, you know it, it's 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 way in the past now yeah but i haven't given up i haven't given up i'm still here you know because it sounds i don't want to end it on a negative sorry i haven't you know that was one <laughs> of those things that didn't end up with a result and didn't end up but i haven't given up and i'm still still writing and and directing and and you know trying to be creative even now so even as we speak I'm about to finish this podcast and um, begin writing a, uh, a first draft of a feature script that um, is from an idea that Mike Tech uh, pitched to me that that, that that I'm working on with him. So there you go. I haven't given up. Yeah. <laughs> well, that's it. I, I've, I was going to sort of say uh, bef- before we do the usual uh, ending sort of where can you find us stuff um that you know at the end of the day you're gonna have setbacks all of us all of us have you know been on productions um and it's gone wrong or it's it's you know you never see a finished product or any of that stuff and and the thing the lesson to learn from this is just keep going it yeah you know just it, it hurts and it's really annoying and it just makes you lose faith in in human beings but you know you have to get back on the the bike and keep going because then you know that's that's what defines people is the fact that you're s- still there and you're still doing it uh you know even because of these setbacks mm. well it really is my lifeblood i mean you know when i'm not watching films i'm trying to make them <laughs> so or thinking about them or talking on podcasts about them so there you go <laughs> indeed so keith how can we find your work right or if you want to find my other work um if you go to british isles that's e-y-l-e-s on youtube um i have six short films that have been made and completed on there for your viewing <laughs> pleasure or not and uh Feel free to like, comment, share, whatever you like. But uh, that's how you can reach me. And uh, you can find uh, all of my completed work uh, on independentrunnings.com. And um, I also have a YouTube channel, uh, which is Independent Runnings. Uh, You can also follow the show on Facebook at Movie Heaven, Movie Hell. Uh, Please go on there. Give us a like. We also have a Twitter page, uh, which is at Movie Heaven Hell. do certainly follow us there and um yeah that's uh that's our podcast extra for this week um join us uh next week for um for the letter j indeed and thank you for letting me share simon you're welcome <laughs>